Greetings and welcome back to room 303 and our talks with Walt as we are calling them. We now turn to poem number 7 of the 24 in inscriptions. This is of course that collection that begins uh, the deathbed edition of Leaves of Grass. The name of this poem is a strange word, idolons, and in fact um, there's going to be some debate about why in a volume where Whitman was professed, trying to make things very simple and direct, that he sometimes uses a word like idolos. By the way, two observations for your notes already. Um, over 25 times this, this word gets used, either in its singular or plural instantiation. So clearly we'll have to define the word and figure out what he's talking about. And I'm going to tell you in advance, it may not be as easy as it seems to simply give you a workable definition of this word, idolos. Um, this is the longest, by the way. We have 21 four-line stanzas for a total of 84 lines, far longer than any of the other poems in the inscription section. And we're going to have to ask, why? Why would he put this poem there? Now, I'm going to make the argument that you need to know this poem to be able to read Leaves of Grass. I mean this. I, it's not a poem that is often well-known by a lot of of Whitman readers. They love to jump, for example, to Song of Myself, or Song of the Open Road, or Oh Captain, My Captain, or Lilac's Last. But I think that there's a whole lot of good reasons to argue. You need this poem. You need to understand this poem if you're going to really appreciate what's going on. Now, with that in mind, let's go ahead and process a few assumptions as we get ready uh, for this talk. Um, I'm assuming several things, not least of which that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net. The previous lectures down the left-hand side, you can find the Talks with Walt folder. I really do hope that you've paid attention to those set of talks. I'm also hopeful that you've messed around with us with the lectures that I gave on Plato's Republic, especially books six and seven, the cave allegory and the theory of the forms. If you don't know that concept, this poem will be problematic for you. If you understand Platonism and dualism, then you're going to be fine. So I've posted in the descriptions box of this lecture where that lecture can be found, that set of comments can be found. So that way, if you are unfamiliar with that, you may want to go back and take a look at that. As well, my comments on Emerson, especially his essay, famous essay, Oversoul. I think you need to know some of that information to be able to read this uh, poem well. As we have said before so many times when we have these conversations, Whitman is really, in some ways, the instantiator in the American psyche of the idea that we are, in fact, the stories that we tell and retell. We are, in fact, the stories we decide to accept and, important for this poem, the stories we decide to reject. Our learning theory is our next assumption that goal is to connect new information to old information in meaningful ways, or as we sometimes will say it, the new is the new, the N-E-W is the K-N-E-W. Everything is built upon prior kinds of storytelling, and we want to pay attention to the ways it happens. Our annotative approach is of three levels. At level one, we ask, what is this text I do of say? Summary. At level two, what does it mean? 2A, themes, messages. At 2B, rhetorical techniques literary techniques, poetic techniques. And then finally, at our third level of reading, we ask, how can I relate to this information in some meaningful way? At 3A, how can I relate to other texts? For example, I'm going to make the argument that Whitman, although he never had much of a formal education, he was in a large measure self-taught, and yet his understanding of Plato and of Homer is truly remarkable. And I, I believe you have to know quite a bit of that information to be able to really appreciate what's going on here. We're going to see Tiresias. We're, of course, going to be seeing the genesis in my arguments that I've made elsewhere at LearnStrong.net in my lectures on T.S. Eliot's Wasteland. Much of Eliot is born in Whitman. And I think a poem like this is very influential on a, a writer like Eliot, who, by the way, loved, for example, in Wasteland, to drop all kinds of interesting unknown words and languages into a poem without any kind of initially published footnotes. What's going on there? I think he's playing a game that Whitman taught to him at a very young age. And then finally in 3B, most importantly, and, and, and if this, and if this uh, set of conversations with Walt, as we're calling them, does anything for you, I hope you have your own copy of the Deathbed Edition. I hope you're marking it up, annotating it. I hope that our comments are just the beginning, that you'll go beneath the epidermis, and that you'll really work to try and figure out, how can I relate to this information in some meaningful way? 
Now, our final assumptions have to do with, first, what we call our big five. In other words, about any text we study, we ask, what does this text have to say about epistemology, what you can know, and especially the fallibilist position as opposed to that absolutist position, I'm right, you're definitely wrong, or the relativist position, there are no truths, there are no absolutes, which seems to suggest, obviously, an absolute of at least one kind, and to that degree, the performative contradiction suggests might want to find a third epistemological position, we call it the fallibilist position, I think it's Whitman's position, and it is simply, I think I'm right, but I could be wrong. And it's that I could be wrong part that's foundational. We ask, what does this text say about ontology, our understanding of being, and then finally, psychology, sociology, the study of the individual mind, the study of the collective mind, and then the odyssey, the question of, why is there evil and suffering and pain in the world, and what can I learn from that information? Whitman will be the one that has taught us in 303 to stop asking, why did this happen to me when something bad happens, and rather learn to ask, why did this happen for me? A study of Whitman's life proves that he understood pain and suffering in powerful, powerful ways, both at the familial level and obviously at the national level. Finally, we're going to ask about Whitman and the five P's, as we call them, these five perspectives on Whitman. Whitman as person, Whitman as poet, we're going to have quite a bit to say about that here. Whitman as pedagogue, here we got to remind ourselves, Whitman started out as an instructor, a teacher, and at 17 he was already teaching, which is ironic given his small amount of education himself. And then Whitman as politician, his love of democracy, his celebration of the democratic ideals, and then finally, and most significantly for our study here, Whitman as philosopher, both from the pre-Socratics and, of course, Socrates, to and through Emerson himself. With that in mind, then, let's turn, as we have done in prior lectures, and go to a bit of background information. Now, this poem, Idolans, was first published in the New York Tribune, the 19th of February, 1876, and then was transferred to inscriptions, 1881. He wrote in his... Uh, journals, his notebook on words, that idolon is a Greek word for phantom, the image of a Helen of Troy instead of real flesh and blood woman. Now immediately we have to think of our Iliad and the Odyssey and the references to Helen and of course as well to Goethe's Faust too when Helen is brought back. We're going to be playing very interesting games philosophically throughout this. Here, then, we're going to have Whitman using this word as what he will refer to as the central concept, in many ways, of Leaves of Grass. That is to say, I don't want to put it in your notes, behind all appearance is soul, the ultimate reality, eternal and changeless. Now, um, this will suggest possibly the influence of uh, Balfour Stewart, um, and P.G. Tate's uh, The Unseen Universe from 1875, whose thesis is, quote, that each organic or inorganic object on Earth makes in the process of its growth a delicate facsimile register of itself on the living sensitive ether that lies immediately around it and bathes and interpenetrates its every atom, end quote. It's clear this is an idea that is very, very influential in the thinking of Whitman. Now, let's pause for a moment and remind ourselves. We're clearly back to Plato's dualism from Republic. You'll remember, we have two boxes. In the first box, above the first box, we write the word physical, or images is the term that's often referenced from Republic. And above the second box, concepts, ideas, or of course, metaphysical, beyond the physical. We point out in the first box that there is a beautiful body. That is to say, a Victoria's Secret model or some beautiful man and we'll put beautiful body in that first box. In the second box, however, we're not interested in the physical, but rather the concept of beauty itself. Or as we say in lectures elsewhere at LearnStrong.net, there's a huge difference between the exchange of fluids, sex, and this thing we call love. Now, if that is true, then obviously we've got to ask about the human, and what is it that's human? Because we have Ruthie's tree out there that, of course, will fit in the first box. And yet there's something fascinating about Ruthie's tree because Ruthie's tree is also something we will call energy. Go back to my lectures 
from the essays on Emerson, especially over soul and nature, and we'll remind ourselves that that notion of energy is a word we kind of throw around. Energy idolons, by the way, you can easily use this as your mnemonic. Oh, yeah, 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 energy, that which can be neither created nor destroyed. Oh, so it doesn't exist. No, no, it definitely exists. Dude, it's basically the whole, the whole existence of, of, of everything we see. You just said it can't be created or destroyed. It clearly can't exist. Well, no, 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 it exists. But we just say energy is that which can be neither created nor destroyed. That is to say, I don't. In other words, we have the physical in the first box. We have the transcendental in the second box. That which transcends the first box. And this notion is going to be central to our reading of this poem. So having, going back and looking at those ideas from Plato are going to be significant, right? As well, we're back to our Homer. And we'll begin the poem with the seer, S-E-E-R, and we immediately think of Tiresias as he comes up, of course, in Homer, as he comes up in Sophocles' plays, as we've studied them and elsewhere, given lectures on them like Antigone. That is to say, it's Tiresias, he who can see the past and the future, the one that Odysseus will journey to visit in Hades to gain information on his way to go back home to Ithaca. And of course we have to think about our Virgil and the Aeneid and the Sibyl, book 3, lines 4, 4, 4, 45 to uh, 452, and, and, and the whole notion of leaves as we talked about it in earlier lectures. With all of that in mind, and far more, Let's turn now to this poem itself and let's appreciate the sections of the poem by their numbered stanzas. Now I normally like to read the entire poem and then we come back to exegete, but because the poem is so long, I'm going to forego that activity. So if you've never read this poem, I would recommend that you maybe go ahead and read the poem and then come back to engage in our discussion. He begins, I met a seer. And again, immediately we have to think about Tiresias here, right? Passing the hues and objects of the world. Now this notion of passing is a part of our understanding of to transcend, the very idea of transcendentalism. We know that Emerson liked better the term idealism than transcendentalism, but it does work. In other words, you can't say, give me 15 pounds of joy. Oh, so joy doesn't exist. No, it definitely exists. It's just, a, it's not a physical reality, it is a metaphysical reality. That is to say, it is somehow beyond. Passing the hues and objects of the world, think first box, to back to our, our notions. The fields of art and learning, pleasure, sense, all four of those listed in order. In other words, there's things epistemologically we can know, we can learn. The fields, that is to say, the domains. We, of course, in 303 love to say that we're playing in the fields of language. We uh, gain an idea like this from, from here, although you'll remember in our Dante that uh, the, the Dante the Pilgrim will visit that limbo area where they sit in the fields and they're having conversations, the great poets, as Dante gets to join them. To glean, now back to agrarian kinds of imagery, idolas. In other words, we are in search of the ultimate reality. You can write it down as that and it will help you to be able to read this poem. Uh, stanza two. Put in, this is now the seer, this is the Tiresias voice speaking to him. Put in thy chance, said he. Now, of course, the word chance is such a great word, right? Because it has to do with singing, it has to do with repetition in poetic language, but when you hear the word chance, C-H-A-N-T-S, said aloud, it sounds a lot like C-H-A-N-C-E. That is to say, just give me a chance. And of course, it works very well. Opportunity will be buried within this word chance. Put in thy chance, said he, no more the puzzling hour nor day nor segments, parts, put in, put first, before the rest, as light for all, an entrance song of all, that of idols. Now we're back to Aristotle and our study of prime mover or first mover. In other words, we're no longer interested in only the puzzling hour, the puzzling day, the segments, the parts. We are looking for the whole, 
the ultimate reality. And of course, we have to think about the influence of our work in 303 by the American philosopher Ken Wilber and his Integralist Perspective. The opening line of sex ecology spirituality, why is there something instead of nothing? And to try to understand some kind of holistic or integral perspective, this is Whitman's perspective. And of course, it was Emerson's perspective as well, right? Stanza three, notice we have this anaphoria, this repetition of first words. Again, we're just learning how to read leaves of grass, so we're going to see so much of this. Notice the word ever. Three times we'll begin the next three lines. Ever, the dim beginning. Now, light was used above. It's a key concept in leaves of grass. I know I keep saying there's so many key concepts, but you'll want to write this down. Pay attention to the way light gets used over and over again in different ways. Ever the dim beginning, ever the growth. Everything is about evolution for, uh, for, for um, Whitman. The rounding of the circle. He loved his Euclid. He loved the idea of geometry. He loved the idea that the study of geometry will lead one ultimately to idolins, right? Ever the summit. He loves his word pictures of mountains. And of course, he learned this from his Dante, the idea that you got to go up to be able to go up. And of course, going up always involves some going down as well. Ever the summit and the merge, the coming together at last. Here's our hope. Here's our hope-filled Whitman, right? To surely start again. Now, this word picture of the spinning wheel, write it down. We're going to come back to it again and again. It will come to its you know, ultimate fruition in our study of Song of Myself, especially passage 48. To surely start again, and then he'll repeat the word idolons, idolons twice, right? Um, and then we'll continue with the word ever. We've got six of these in a row to just demonstrate what anaphoria is like. Ever the mutable, what can change, evolve. Ever materials changing, crumbling, Recohering. Now, <clears throat> I made the, arg the argument in my lectures on T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets, especially East Coker, that there's a lot of Whitman in those poems. And of course, Dry Salvage is no question the most American of the four poems of, of Eliot's Four Quartets. But just the beginning of East Coker, I mean, think about that. In my beginning is my end. In succession, houses rise and fall, crumble, are extended, removed, restored, destroyed or in their places an open field, or a factory, or a bypass. Old stone to new building, right? I mean, think about the ways in which we're playing the game right here. Ever materials changing, crumbling, recohering, ever the the uh, the adli adlias, the, the uh, workshop, the artistic studio, the factories divine, again, you can hear this at the beginning of East Coker, issuing Idolins. In other words, everything he argues in Leaves of Grass is about building, growing. America is dynamic. America is the epic poem for Whitman, and here he'll play the same game. Stanza five, low. And, and this word low is an interesting word. It comes out of his Quaker background, and it is a word that will show reverence, respect. I or you or woman, man or state, known or unknown, we, seeming solid wealth, strength, build, uh, beauty, build, but really build idols. Now here we have the fallibilist notion. Here we have Plato's Republic Book 7 and the cave allegory and the shadows on the wall. In other words, we have this tendency to think that what we are doing is building some kind of solid wealth or strength or even beauty but what we're really building is this ultimate reality, these idolins. Stanza six, the ostent, the, this has to do with a, a token or a portent, um, evervescent, the substance of an artist's mood or uh, seven studies long, the scholar, we're gonna get to the scholar in a bit, or warriors, martyrs, heroes' tolls, Note, uh, notice, your, notice your threes, to fashion his Idolins. In other words, everything is pointing towards this ultimate reality. Whether you're an artist, you're a scholar, you're a warrior, you're a martyr, you're a hero, doesn't matter. Everything is pointing towards the ultimate reality. In other words, all the stories from the very beginning of the tradition that we call the Western tradition, Whitman's going to argue, all is culminating in what's happening 
in his poem as a mirror of the American democracy. It's quite a compelling argument. Stanza 7. Of every, notice the word every, every human life, he very influenced by Coleridge's Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner in our, in our comments there about the end of that, right? All things, great and small. And then notice the parenthetic. He loves this, much like Emily Dickinson, to be able to say something while he's saying something. The units gathered, posted, not a thought, emotion, deed, left out. Everything is important. Put it in your notes. Everything, all the way down to a dung beetle, is going to be important for Whitman. There is nothing insignificant, as Tennyson will say, in Ulysses, I am part of all that I have met, right? The whole, or large, or small, summed up. Now notice we have this elided verb again to capture somehow the American vernacular. Summed up. Added up. And it's a no. Now, again, this is why we will argue for the interval perspective. There is um, there, there's a powerful notion in the line that no human mind is capable of a 100% error. There's all of this stuff that's happening. How can we somehow integrate it into some kind of whole summed up? That's the goal of Leaves of Grass. And early on now in this poem, in the inscriptions chapter, he's telling us, this is my goal. This above all, this is my goal. Stanza 8. The old, old, and notice the repetition of the word old, both at the beginning of the stanza and then at the end, twice. The old, old urge, the backward-looking part of, of, of his philosophy, based on the ancient principles. We think of the perennial philosophy, of course, of Huxley and others, based on the ancient principles, and then again the word low. Newer, higher pinnacles. Again, this is that integralist idea of transcend and include. Where you are in the stage of your life right now is working for you. Awesome. But it won't work forever. Inevitably, you're going to find the stage in your life that you're in will begin to have its holes, its weaknesses, and then you will move on to the next stage. You will transcend. However, you will include something from, from before. This is why we say where the stories we accept and also the stories that we reject or partially reject or move beyond. Here we are. The old, old urge based on the ancient.